Hello and welcome to Just Films and That. This is the podcast where we are going to discuss a film that we think might be underrated, underappreciated, or we just wanted to talk about it. This week, it's another classic film as Alice has picked Breakfast at Tiffany's. So, let's see what we think. So, Alice. Josh. Another classic film. Mm hmm. Breakfast at Tiffany's. Mm hmm. 1961. Spoilers if you've not seen a 60 year old film. Um, but, Alice, obviously it's a classic. But, why did you pick it to talk about it? And what is it about? So, Breakfast at Tiffany's is a rom com based on a novel, and it follows the story of a young socialite named Holly Go Lightly, played by Aubrey Hepburn in New York City. You get an idea of Holly as being a bit of a fun loving, carefree gal as she arrives home from nights out in the morning. She hosts hedonistic parties and is always losing her keys. She's also obsessed with the store Tiffany's and says this is her happy place. She then meets a young man who moves into her apartment building. His name is Paul. He's played by George Peppard and Holly takes a bit of a liking to him because he reminds her of her brother Fred and so she chooses to call him Fred, even though that isn't Paul's name. <laughs> so quirky. There's a bit of a will they, won't they <laughs> throughout the film between Holly and Paul Fred, but we soon start to find out that their lives are a little more complicated than first thought. Holly got married when she was 14 and has some stepchildren, and now her husband or her ex-husband has come looking for her. And Paul is a struggling writer who seems to have a paid sexual arrangement with a wealthy woman who's helping him pay his way. So we follow these two young, beautiful lovebirds through the trials and tribulations of trying to make it in New York, and eventually they get together and we'll assume that they lived happily ever after. So the reason I picked this one, Josh, so for any new listeners who we may have, something that we like to do on the podcast every now and then is to dive into a classic film that perhaps one of us hasn't seen and sort of try and determine if it is a classic, why it's a classic, or why these certain films have sort of stood the test of time. So previous ones we've done have been things like The Great Dictator, Vertigo, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, and it felt like it was about time to do another one. The reason I picked Breakfast to Tiffany's was it just kind of felt, I don't know what had been going on this year, if it was perhaps a, an anniversary year of it, of something to do with the film, but it's just kind of been around a lot. It was definitely trending on Twitter a few months ago. It's also one that kind of gets mentioned in pop culture a lot, whether it's things, you know, like The Simpsons, like Family Guy, or like in Friends. I know it's like Rachel says that it's one of her favorite films and it does kind of get brought up a lot there. And I had never seen it and I don't really think I'd ever seen an Audrey Hepburn film. So I was like, right, well, there we go. It's got to be Breakfast at Tiffany's. That has to be the one for me. Uh, Josh, had you seen this one before? No, no, I hadn't seen it. I was quite, I, I was quite interested to see um, what it was like uh, watching it. I think it's been around a lot this year, back to what you were saying then, because I think it's 60 years old this year. 61, so, yeah, of course. Yeah, so, so I'm get, that, that must be why. I mean, it is an incredibly famous film, you know, the legacy of the film, you know, it's, so, it's just so famous. Um, so that's what I knew about it going in. I knew, you know, the very famous poster of Audrey Hepburn, everyone knows the hair up, the black dress, the cigarette holder, the jewellery, all that sort of thing. So... Other than that, other than the famous uh, images around it and the um, the song, <laughs> the uh, the deep blue something is it? Yeah, but which didn't feature in the film at all. Much no, to it's mine. not in the film. And for me, so uh, the film was for, it was. The film was poorer for the, the lack of Deep Blue Something for me. Absolutely. Um, That's what I expected. The song released in the mid nineties. Yeah, and, and, and you know. <laughs> If it, you know, some people say, well, it wasn't out then, so how could it be in the film? And to, to them, people, I say, well, look at Star Wars. You know, George Lucas has arguably improved those films over time by putting things in it, like hand moving his head. And I'm going to stop talking because I'm probably just baiting people on the internet at this but point. But there you go, though. See, I'm <laughs> done. A little more effort, guys. Exactly. So, um, no, I hadn't seen it. So I was interested to see what it was like. But we'll start with you. So neither of us had seen it. What? Did we think? Alice, what did you like about it? Did you like it? What did you think? So, Josh, I, to be honest, was a little bit underwhelmed. Um, there's been this kind of feeling when we've watched other classic films of 
just it being sort of quite monumental and really feel like you're watching something. And I feel like that was missing with this for me, but we will start off with the things that I did like about it. Uh, so it looks phenomenal. You've got this beautiful New York setting and these beautiful shops and cafes and bars, and it all looks great. There's a lot of wonderful costume choices. I did see that a lot of Audrey Hepburn's costume was, was supplied by Givenchy. So, you know, that's already going to be way up there. And obviously, a primary theme of it is she kind of likes the finer things, doesn't she? She's obsessed with Tiffany's, even if she's not necessarily super well off herself. Her apartment is quite modest, we could say, but she likes the finer things, you know, diamonds and jewellery and, and all these wonderful things and these beautiful outfits. She had some amazing hats that I was a huge fan of. There's uh, one thread of the story is that she's visiting a, a gangster who's in prison and she goes to visit him every now and then and she gets paid, I believe, to go and visit him and then he gives her sort of these secret code messages to kind of send off to his gangster buddies that come in the form of a weather report. So I think one of them is something like, oh, there's going to be heavy snow in Chicago. And she's like, what? Snow in Chicago? Who'd have thought it? So she's like completely oblivious to this. Um, the humour for a lot of the film was a bit, it was quite like that throughout. It was this sort of misdirection and people kind of not being aware of, of certain bits of information and having a kind of ignorance to certain things, I think. Uh, so it did have some quite funny moments. I did quite like some aspects of Holly's character. Uh, she does, she wants to be um, strong and she doesn't want people to think that she's helpless. She can get things for herself. Some people question perhaps the way that she does get these things, like the way she makes money. People people pay her for 50, people pay her $50 to go into the powder room. Now, I don't know if I'm just being super naive here, Josh, but what does that mean? Are they paying her to have Sex in the powder I don't know room? if it's or... necessarily sex. I don't. I, I got the impression that she was sort of an escort, yeah. but in the in the I don't know if it's me being a bit naive, but I got the impression that she was going on paid dates with people, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily having sex with them. I don't. I, I don't know. I know it's based on a book which I haven't read, but Paul, the male character, seems to be a male escort, doesn't mm -hmm. he? Even if it's just for yeah. one one customer, so perhaps. There's something there in them sharing the building and sharing the where they live and stuff. I, yeah, I I think she's just an, I think she's an escort. Never explicitly says it, but then I don't know if they could explicitly say it at that time. True, and I feel like maybe in at that time saying, "Oh, I'm getting paid for the powder room or for going to the powder room." That was probably like a bit of an analogy <laughs> yeah. back then. Whereas these yeah. days, I mean, we don't have powder rooms. You know, we're just going down the bog or going for a slash or something. Do you know what I mean? Going like, down the bog going or down, going for a slash. <laughs> and I never yeah, yeah. say either of those things. I was trying to think, what do people say? I was like, I don't know. I would pay good money for a remake of Breakfast at Tiffany's starring you in which you go on a date with a man and go, just going the bog. Just going just, to the bog for a slash. Listen, 50 quid, I'm going for a slash. All right. <laughs> That's the film. That's the film people want to see. And I said, what? <laughs> Breakfast <laughs> at Tiffany's. Come on, let's get this on Patreon. Let's get this film made. Um, so she had quite a few interesting moments where, you know, she kind of wants to prove herself as like being self-sufficient. And this, because you find out as the story goes on that she was married. She was married off when she was 14 years old. So was obviously completely reliant on this man and then became a stepmother to these children very early on. And now she's kind of throwing off the shackles and she's like, no, this is what I want to do. I want this freedom. I want to party. I want to have a great time. Because she does throw like this very lavish party, doesn't she, at her apartment where it's just, there's so many people. Like it's weird now, obviously seeing things like this post COVID, but there's so many people there and they're all so close to one another. Like you can't move two inches without brushing up against another person. And some of them are just absolutely shit-faced and like one of them falls over and stuff. And you get a lot of this, a lot of the male characters feel this sense of ownership over her. You know, if they go out on one of these dates, he's like, there's one character who follows her up to her apartment and basically like is knocking on her door and kind of demanding her presence and being like, oh, but I, I paid $50 for you. I, you owe me and I own you. And there's a lot of this kind of idea of ownership and particularly, I would say kind of male upon female ownership. But then Fred, excuse me, Paul, Paul Fred does address it of being 
more of an equal sort of ownership. You know, people need to sort of own each other and belong to one another, and that's what love is and such. But there is a lot of this of the male characters thinking, oh, I have a claim to her because I've paid for her, which obviously that's not, if she is an escort, which, you know, given what you've said, and now that I'm trying to be a bit less naive, she probably was, right? I mean, yeah, I, I, I think, I, I I think so. so. I think so. Yeah. And so, and that's fine, but you know, you don't own someone because of that. You pay for the time that you've paid for, and then that's it. And now I'm going home to my flat, sort of thing. Um, so interesting kind of themes there about this kind of female empowerment and and what it means to be a woman on your own, trying to make it in the big city as she was. Uh, what about you, Josh? How how did you feel when you came away from it? Because I know we've had some pretty potent reactions to some of the classic films we've done. I'm thinking back to The Great Dictator. I know that had quite a profound effect on both of us. Mm. What did you feel when you came away from this one? I'm interested to know, actually. Indulge me. What do you think I thought of it? Because I think I know what you might say. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know, Josh, because you have quite interesting tastes and I feel like you find a lot of pleasure in things that perhaps I wouldn't. I know mm. we've disagreed on on certain films in the past. You, you, you know, I'll, I'll go back to About Time, a film mm. that I know you really, really enjoyed, mm. but mm. I didn't. So I know that our tastes do vary, but we do appreciate certain qualities in films, I think. Yes, yeah. So I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to say that you didn't love it would i be right yeah pretty much okay. yeah so so i went into this expecting to love it mm -hmm. and i didn't um okay. i think we have the same probably issues with it which we'll come on to but let's start with the positives from my end what did i like about it well as you've said a lot of what you've said there it looks amazing i can see how this did become one of the blueprints for things like the modern rom-com you know the rom-com format has changed over time and, and 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 you know this is one of them one of the ones that set those parameters those boundaries those expectations Another one is like when Harry met Sally and then other films have done it as well. And I, I liked looking at it from that point of view as almost a piece of, of film history. It does look amazing. It does look very glamorous. New York looks incredible. Everyone knows the imagery around this film. Tiffany's, as I said before, the cigarette holder, the jewellery, the hats, the hair, the dresses, all that sort of stuff. And the cigarette holder seemed to get longer and longer yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. it was like the, two feet long by, by, the end, it a, by the end it was basically a golf club it was just yeah. like, <laughs> but um, I think a lot of it's quite well written I enjoyed some of the dialogue it captured a lot of because there's a lot of people in it who were like you probably say were quite lovies you know darling and all that sort of thing mm. and I think it captures the way a lot of those people or the way the characters speak very well they speak very look very sort of lyrically Holly does that thing where she weaves in and out of different languages not fluently but she thinks says things like lapping up vino which is something that we now consider quite commonplace but I, I wonder if perhaps at the time it wasn't so I thought that was quite interesting um I did think Audrey Hepburn was good in it um I thought I, I, I've not seen her in much else either I don't think and I thought she got the balance really well between Vun Holly is quite a complex character, isn't she, which you've already touched on in terms of what she's like as a person. In terms of Audrey Hepburn's performance, I think she does a really good job of striking the balance between vulnerability, reliance, and independence. You know, she wants to be this independent lady of leisure, but she sort of can't, but also is really vulnerable and quite ha has, you know, has been through some stuff, is quite damaged in, in some ways. And I think that, you know, Let's be honest, Audrey Hepburn is just, it's just very, she's very beautiful. She's very charming. She's very magnetic. She is a movie star. She absolutely is. It's quite funny in places as well. There's a bit where they're at a party and um, it sort of goes round the party and you see like a couple of slapsticky style, style scenes where, you know, someone's head. Uh, dropping a cigarette in someone's like hair arrangement or hat or mm -hmm. something and there's another woman talking to herself in the mirror and then it cuts back and she's crying there's another few bits where there's a guy with an eye patch and he doesn't seem to need an eye patch he just lifts it off at one point it's not particularly my sense of humor and it's a little uh 
It's a little beigey. The humour, it's a little meh. Do you know what I mean? A little bland. It's kind of PG, isn't it? Yeah, it's very you know, obvious. We've, we've got to make sure that this gets the censor or that this yeah, gets the it, certification. It's very, it it's very of the time humour, but mm. it's still, you know, it, it's okay. Um, and the music is very iconic as well. Everyone knows Moon River. Um, <laughs> oh my God, how many times? Like <laughs> and every, every and five it. minutes? Oh, my goodness. It. Um, if you like Moon River, then let me tell you, this is the film Yeah, if you, you like the song... Wow. <laughs> Wow, what was the, it was um, constant, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, it was like the brothers Solomon with um, what was the song that's always in that? Fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Comparing horizon. the, but it the was brothers because... Solomon with Breakfast at Tiffany's. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but you're right though, and it it used like different iterations of it as well, as yeah. does the brother Solomon. You know, one that's <laughs> a bit more stripped back, and one that's just the instrumental because she, um, Holly, can play the. The it's I feel like it wasn't a guitar. It was a very small guitar. I'm not too oh, sure. So, is it a ukulele was. or something like is that? Is it a ukulele? Or a ma yeah. Mandolin or something so like that. So she was, definitely wasn't a mandolin. Come on, Josh, you should Sorry. know a mandolin from a ukulele. Yeah. <laughs> a lute, <laughs> a lute, a tiny guitar. Um, and she's playing it on the balcony, isn't she? And she's doing her own version of Moon River. And then it was just, it was just everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. I hadn't and thought it's, of and it, Brother and Solomon. It's, wo it's woven funny. into the score as well. I think it was written for the film. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they do that. I know this is probably a, a strange comparison, but they do that quite often with Bond films. I don't know if it's that the score informs the Bond song or if the Bond song informs the score. But if you look oh, at a lot of them, yeah. like the uh, the famous bits of music from things like Skyfall and Spectre and Goldfinger mm. and all that are usually woven into the score. And I think it creates some almost musical experience when you're watching the film or it gives you points of reference where... It's supposed to emote, right? Is it supposed to help you emote, isn't it? So you know you're supposed to feel this way because of this piece of music or whatever. Okay, so let's move on to talking about things that we perhaps didn't like about the film or that we've changed. Now, there's a couple of things here. But Alice, you go first. What would you change? What didn't you like about the film? So there was a few things. I think first we'll address the obviously very harmful, negative and atrocious stereotype of Holly's upstairs neighbour mm -hmm. and the way that he is portrayed. I know that this is something that has already been addressed in the kind of wider context of cinema and is something that everyone is agreed is obviously not okay. And there was a warning at the beginning of the film, you know, when I started watching it, like warning, there are some harmful stereotypes in this. So that has been addressed. Uh, but obviously that's not, it, you wouldn't, it wouldn't go unnoticed at all, would it? It was quite a stark kind of thing yeah, in the film that um... felt really, really quite odd. Yeah, it sticks out like a sore thumb, it really does. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you haven't seen the film, uh, Mickey Rooney, who is a sort of very famous actor, was a child actor, then went on to, to be a comedy actor. Um, he, he plays the owner of the apartment where Holly lives. He is a Japanese character who Mickey Rooney portrays through the use of, you know, caricature, you know, offensive makeup, that sort of thing. It's not okay. I think it's important that we address that. It's not. There are other things that we're going to talk about. I don't think we're going to absolutely hammer this point home. The fact that remains is it's not okay. Um, it has since been addressed since the film came out by people involved in the making of the film. I personally don't believe in taking these things out of films. Look, I am white, so I perhaps don't have... Uh, I, it's perhaps not for me to say. But my personal view is is that... I don't believe in taking these things out of films. I think it should be very much flagged up, addressed. And like we said then at the start of the film, you know, this isn't okay. This is outdated, but it's still there. We can't pretend it didn't happen. And I think to pretend it didn't happen is actually more dangerous than it is to address that it did, move on and accept that it shouldn't happen again. Yeah, and it's important to see the evolution of film and where lessons have been learned and mm. how culture has changed mm. and how that kind of works within film as well as within society. Mm. Uh, but that is obviously the biggest glaring one. Mm. For me, kind of more of a general point is I feel like sometimes the way that the film was put together it just kind of felt like it was quite restricted. So a lot of the action takes place in Holly's apartment. And then some of the scenes that happen outside of that, it almost felt as if there was kind of a bit of a rush to get everything done 
or that the writers weren't quite sure how to make one thing flow into the next. So we get this sequence where Paul is in his room with his uh, late lady friend, should we say, who we believe is paying him for sex. And they're looking out the window and there's a man standing there and they think, oh, he's a private detective who's been following me, you know, hired by my husband and following me to see, you know, where I've been going every day. So they go out and Paul does, you know, he tries to get him to follow him so he can try and discover who he is. And he eventually just walks right up to him and says like, oh, I'm Holly, although she's not Holly, she's Lulu Lulu May. Lulu May, yeah. Lulu May. She says, I'm Lulu May's husband and I've come to get her. And the way that all that happened just didn't feel really natural. It didn't feel authentic. It just kind of felt like, oh, we need to make this happen to give Holly, to give Audrey Hepburn's character the depth that we want her to have. Because I appreciate that they're trying to design this character who, you know, is running away from something, who's run away from the countryside, from this old life that she didn't want and didn't really sign up for and certainly wasn't old enough to kind of give consent. And now she's trying to make it herself. So I understand what they're trying to do. I just didn't think they did did it as well as, say, some other films. And I, I was quite often thinking about Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and the way that film was constructed. And it was, it did just do a better job. The other thing as well, and I won't go into this too much because I feel like everyone will hate me, but there were a couple of issues, I thought, with Audrey Hepburn's performance. Um, she's clearly, you know, like you've already said, she is striking, she's iconic, and I completely get that at the time she would have been, you know, so, so impressive and just this real darling of the screen. But some of her acting I just didn't really find convincing, and a lot of the time when she was either surprised or sad, her mouth would just hang open for sort of moments and moments at a time, and if Paul would say something that would make her even more sad, her mouth would just hang wider open. And it just kind of, it was just almost this one setting. So it was a lot of very, I suppose, theatrical acting, really, and, and sort of lacked the subtlety of perhaps Jane Russell, who I just thought, who, you know, I hadn't even seen before Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, and she just blew me away. And the gravitas that she had on screen. And I feel like this was just missing slightly with Audrey Hepburn. And just a couple of slightly strange things. So one of the reasons that Holly is drawn to Paul is that he reminds her so much of her brother. And she seems to find this a turn on. And, you know, she mm. wants to kiss him and get in his bed. And eventually they get together. And she keeps saying, oh, you remind me of Fred. You remind me of my of Fred. You remind me so much of my brother that I'm going to start calling you his name. Can you imagine if you started calling your partner by your sibling's name? Weird. But again, I think maybe that just alludes to kind of how damaged she is and maybe that she has some, like, unresolved emotional issues. So, you know, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt for that. Um, there's a scene towards the end where Holly is planning on going to the airport to fly to Brazil because she's met a wealthy politician, I believe. He's someone who may or may not become the next president of Brazil and she wants to fly out there to meet him, but he's suddenly decided, no, you know, it's not good for my look, you know, to have that, that sort of woman with me. So she and Paul are in a taxi Oh, in, the, in a, like a New York yellow cab, which, I mean, the yellow cabs themselves look amazing. All those classic cars driving around 60s New York, I thought was incredible. But the guy is sat there and his hands are dead, dead still. And the wheel is just moving like up and down his hands. I don't know if you notice this, but it's like someone's down below, like with a stick attached to the steering wheel and just pushing it up and down, up and down like that. And I was like, oh, and little things like that take you out of the world of the film, I think. And they just, you know, they remind you, oh, this is a film, that's a prop, this is a set, that sort of thing. And just generally on the whole, it didn't feel as brilliantly executed as perhaps some of the previous films had been. I feel like there was a lot of work and a lot of focus on the appearance, on maybe things like Audrey Hepburn's costume and her hair, that I feel like some areas of the script were lacking, some of the character development and some of the relationship development between the characters was also quite lacking. So it just left me feeling a bit unsatisfied at the end and like I didn't really care that much what happened to any of the characters. But also saying that, it's a rom-com, right? It's meant to be lighthearted. Maybe, you know, I shouldn't have been looking for these huge kind of political or like 
you know, huge statements about the world or about culture or about feminism or any of this. And it is, like, it was just meant to be a rom-com. And I suppose if you looked at it that way, then it's it's done its job, probably. But anyway, I feel like I've gone on a little while there. Josh, what about you? What are some of the things that you would change or maybe that you didn't like? I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what you've said there. Um, there's two main issues for me. We've already addressed some of the ageing, but some of the other ageing does take me out of it a little bit, which is one of the issues. So obviously we've got Mickey Rooney's character. We've addressed that. The fa- I struggled a little bit with the fact that she was a 14-year-old child bride. And I struggled yeah. a little bit with the, all you've already touched on it, the ownership around Holly, that idea of like, I mm-hmm. own you. And I know that they try and write it off as saying, well, that's what lovers, two people own each other. But at the end of the day, Paul tells her that he owns her. She goes off and they get back together. And it, I just feel like it's a bit of a cop out. I don't really, I feel like she just, she sort of moves from man to man who she wants to own her. And, all, you know, they show some independence a little bit, but I don't think you really get that. I think we needed a little bit more character development from that. And I think the reason that I feel like that, and that brings me on to my second issue, is that I feel like the film is ultimately style over substance. And I know mm-hmm. there's plenty of films that are stylish that people go and they want to see beautiful people in lovely dresses or cool cars or whatever, and that is fine. But I feel like this could have been something more. And I feel like, yes, it is a rom-com, but I didn't find it that funny and I didn't find it that romantic. It's more romantic than it is funny, and I'll give it that. There are romantic moments in it. That bit. (laughs) But I felt like, because they were so focused on how beautiful it was and New York Mm. and... I think that the plot and the script, other than the things I've said about it that I liked in some of the dialogue, I think it lacks cohesion. I found some of it hard to follow. I wasn't too sure what was going on. And I don't know if perhaps they assumed everyone had read the book or that people knew the book and could follow the characters that easily. Very interesting point, of course, of mm, course. I also, all, and you always lose certain elements, don't you, when, you, when you're doing that, yeah. changing it from the book to the screen, but that's always going to be a huge challenge. Anyway, apologies. But it's, about, but it's about interpreting the book and making it equally as good as, for example, mm-hmm. I would say a lot of, I mean, all of the Harry Potter films, but particularly the later ones when the books get really, really heavy. Um, I found it a little boring in places, if I'm honest. I felt like you said there's a lot of scenes in... Holly's apartment, Paul's apartment, one place, another place, and they're all a little, they're a little slow, a little boring. Um, Did you feel? I felt like you know the party scene mm. where Holly is hosting the party. I feel like that went on far, far yeah. too long, given that not really much happens, and you don't even get much conversation from some of the extras and the background cast. You're just getting, you know, this hubbub of like. Mm. You know, there is action, there is ambiance, but not not much really happens. And that's actually another point that I forgot to mention. Sorry, I'm not gonna railroad you. I will let you finish yours. But a lot of the a lot of the background actors and a lot of the extras just weren't doing enough yeah. at all. And I, I I feel like perhaps that is down to the directing. Do you remember when we did Easy A? Mm. And one of my comments about that was that the background actors and the extras were always doing so much and played such an important role in bringing the scenes to life. And in this, that was just really, really missing. And I feel like just a few tweaks here and there. I think it's important to give your extras something tangible to talk about instead of just being like, oh, just just have a conversation. It's like, oh, what shall I say? It's like, oh, just whatever. It doesn't matter. So then what you get is people going, blah, 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 yeah. blah. And they're not even saying words and they're not having a conversation, which means their faces don't look engaged. And given the amount of time that you spend with those additional characters because of how long we were at the party... I feel like more attention should have been given to that. But anyway, sorry, Josh, as you were saying. No, I completely agree with you. And I think it goes back to my point, which is it's style over substance. Perhaps they've gone, well, we've got Audrey Hepburn and we've got George Papard, so Mm, let's put the beautiful people at the front and it doesn't really matter because everyone will be looking at the beautiful people, so why would they be looking at the extras in the back? But I didn't particularly notice that, but if I had, it would have taken me out of it. And you are right, things like Easy A and other films as well, by doing that, they feel like they create a more self-contained world which can suck you in, mm-hmm. whereas this doesn't really do that much. And there is a bit of, I think, a bit of staleness to the director. You know, Blake Edwards, who did direct it, has a is one of the legends of sort of American comedy film directing. But in this, I don't know if there's much to direct. There's just a lot of wandering around, apartment, wandering around apartments and sets and stuff. 
So it is. I think it's a little style over substance. I wanted a little bit more from it, whether that will be generically or in terms of character development. I know I've said that I don't want to harp on about how it's aged, but it is. It was really interesting, just to echo something you've said, it was really interesting to watch this considering the portrayal of, of leading female characters when we've watched Gentlemen Prefer Blondes that came out the decade before. Before it. Mm. And so you can't even really say it's that much to do with the dated, the, the 60s, it being 60 years old, I think, because there's something else there that is older than that and it, and it isn't as much, and you know, it isn't, didn't feel as old as this did in some ways um, in terms of the portrayal of the female characters. But ultimately, yeah, little boring style of a substance. And, and I'll be honest, it just it needed to be more cohesive. I couldn't always tell what was going on. Okay, so we'll move on to talking about the critical reception in a moment. But first, Alice... I believe Josh. you're going to take us on a journey. I am indeed, Josh and listeners. We're going to go on a journey down the rabbit hole for this bit that we're going to call Alice Down the Rabbit Hole. So, so Josh and listeners who have seen the film, did you notice in the opening credits that one of the actors was called Miss Beverly Hills? Well, I simply had to follow this one down the rabbit hole. It turns out Miss Beverly Hills, real name Beverly Powers, was the beautiful, sultry burlesque dancer who we see while Holly and Paul are out on the town. Beverly started working as a dancer at the Tropicana in Las Vegas when she was just 17 years old. She was soon discovered by a different nightclub owner who turned her into a national star. She started appearing in magazines and nabbing herself some small movie roles in the early 60s, breakfast at Tiffany's being her first. She made various appearances, usually as a dancer across film and television until the late 70s. She was also an uncredited topless swimmer in Jaws. But in the most recent bit of information I could find about her, this would indicate that maybe her life went in a different direction as she became an ordained minister with the living ministry in Maui, Hawaii in around 1991, where, as far as I can tell, she remains to this day. And that was Alice Down the Rabbit Hole. So she's a... A minister in Hawaii, did you say? Mm-hmm. So perhaps she's having breakfast at Epiphany's? Nope, but makes sense. Oh, no. No, it doesn't make sense, does it? It's that's fine. That's not the... Literally, Josh, that isn't the worst joke I've ever heard you say. So, well, yeah, you know... We'll keep that in. Well... We'll keep that in. <sighs> Great. <laughs> So we'll move on to talking about the critical reception then. Now, obviously, Alice, you picked this, so I haven't seen the critical reception. But what we mm. need to decide now is, is it deserving of its classic status? So lay it on me. How did it do? Well, first of all, Josh, how do you think it did? Or what would you give this, do you think? If you're thinking out of 100 or out of 10? What would I... Wise? I would probably give it like... Uh, five or a six. Wow, yeah. Um, what I, th I think it probably did pretty well. I reckon it probably mm. is up there in the eights. It is a classic film in the sense of, if you said name a classic Audrey Hepburn film, this would probably be the one. Or yeah, I know there's People a, there's, still bang on about it. Yeah, they? and there's a few. There's My Fair Lady, Roman Holiday, that sort of thing. But I think mm -hmm. this is one. This is a classic film, if anything, because of the famous imagery around it that we've already talked about. So, mm -hmm. how did it do then? So, at the time of recording, on IMDb, it got 7.6. Now, if you move over to Rotten Tomatoes, now the audience gave it 91% and the critics gave it 89% on Rotten Tomatoes. So, I, straight off the bat, I, I do think that's overrated. Mm. Um, there is this thing with the classic films that we've done, isn't there, where they do score very, very highly. And I do wonder if a lot of the critics are looking back with this kind of air of nostalgia or of, mm. you know, just thinking, oh yeah, these are the films that have stood the test of time, therefore they're deserving of higher scores. So I'm, I'm torn on it, Josh, to be honest. And I feel like compared to uh, the other films that we've done, it just isn't as good um, but I do think a lot of it is to do with what you said about it being style over substance. Like I'm looking now at, even at the Rotten Tomatoes page and it is 
this picture of Audrey Hepburn with her hair done up. There's diamonds in her hair and these huge big black sunglasses and these black gloves. And that is it, isn't it? That is the image. That is what people think of when they think of this film. And I think maybe for that reason, it has a special place in people's hearts. But if you're thinking about... Well, I suppose you said that thing about it may be... Uh, influencing sort of the modern rom-com and what rom-coms could be, and in particular, New York-based rom-coms, rom-coms of which there are many. So I wonder maybe in that sense, but for me, I just don't, I just don't know, you know. What what do you think? Tell me some of your thoughts. So I I suppose my sense, sense on it is, is, is that everything I've said, it wasn't necessarily the film for me. It wasn't. Yeah. In terms of is it deserving of its classic status, that is really, really tricky, like you've just said, because it is iconic. It captures a moment in time, and it has such a legacy and such a glamour linked to it in terms of everything that you associate. Everybody knows the black dress, the hair, the cigarette holder, the gloves, all that. Moon River, Every everybody knows that. So I would probably say... As a film, it's not for me. But is it deserving of its classic status in terms of what it has given to, I suppose, in terms of what it has given to the world and what its legacy suggests? It probably is because you can't argue with the fact that it is just so well known. So I would say mm. for me, you know, the film itself, I'm not bothered on, but the, but the film's imagery and its, you know, its legacy are inarguably there for everyone to see so it probably is deserving of its classic status what would you say yeah i think you've made a compelling argument there and if you're thinking about the things that are still present very much present now in in pop culture um then i i could agree with you on that like moon river like the look like the fact that there is a very 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 popular song called breakfast at tiffany's and that sort of thing so yeah i would say it is deserving of its classic status but I would also say that I personally believe it's a little bit overrated as well. Well, there we go. Is that our first um, classic that is overrated but is deserving of its classic status? I think maybe we thought Vertigo was oh, did also we? a touch overrated mm. but still deserving of its classic status. I think if you can still see the influences and the impact the film has had on modern film and television, then it deserves its place. But yes, a tinsy bit overrated in my opinion. Well, there we go. Um, yeah, well, as, as Alice said there, it's in a very, very specific vault with possibly, <laughs> possibly we think, Vertigo of, yes, it deserves to be a classic, but it's a little bit overrated in our eyes, in the eyes of these humble podcasters. But what do we know? Mm -hmm. Next week will be our Christmas special. So are you excited for that, Alice? You... Oh, absolutely thrilled. It feels like just yesterday we were doing the Halloween special. Absolutely. So keep your eyes peeled for the Christmas special. It will be in your feeds next week. In the meantime, if you could give us a little rating or review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast, that would be very much appreciated. You might have your phone in your hand right now. You might have your phone on you. Do you know what? It would be a lovely Christmas present for us if oh, you could give would. us a little it review. It would be very much appreciated. And you don't even have to wrap it. Probably, I think. I don't know. I d yeah, no, I don't think so. They haven't figured that out yet, old Apple. Yeah, don't wrap it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you'd like to get in touch with us in the meantime, then the email is filmsandthatpod at gmail.com. We're on all the social medias, aren't we, Alice? We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're on TikTok. TikTok. And the website is www.justfilmsandthatpod.com. Um, until next week, Alice Oliver, thank you very much for joining me as ever. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Josh, and thank you. Uh, and it's cheerio from me. See you next week for the Christmas special. Bye.